related things. Now, this is not truly part of the membrane, but it's associated enough with it that, at least in the classroom, we're going to talk about membranes. You might as well throw this stuff in as well. I believe in one of the lectures I wasn't around, uh, Dr. Hamas, who talks a little bit in, in one of the lectures when I was missing, I was in the hospital or whatever, but we're going to toss it in a little bit more and take a look at it. Because once again, this is very important in quite a few aspects, both in development and also in the fact that you can make a multicellular organism. That's a really nice thing to have. And this is what we call the extracellular the extracellular matrix, or ECM for short. Now the term extracellular means outside the cell, and matrix is just some kind of material. And the quick and dirty definition of what extracellular matrix is, is this. Here's a cell, and what this stuff is, is a bunch of secreted proteins and polysaccharides that the cells produce and secrete this material on the outside and then they're surrounded by it and embedded in it. And it's made up of various different kinds of proteins and or polysaccharides. So now you have a cell, here's the cell membrane, and you got this layer, it could be very thin, but it can also be very thick, that surrounds the whole cell. And all the cells have this stuff. Some of them have very thin layers, but some of them have very, very thick layers. And this material is very important. It's not just garbage. You know, sometimes you get kind of like the mental image of some of the trailers you see down here where they throw all this stuff out the front door and they're just surrounded by all their old garbage. I see a few on the way into work. You know, I'm sick and in a couple of rural areas. It doesn't look great. But anyway, it's actually not that. It's not just cellular garbage. This stuff is extremely important both for cell function and for organismal function. Now let's take a look at a couple key aspects of it. We'll look at more detail. One of the most important things is that the extracellular matrix can act as a glue to cause cells to stick together allowing individual cells to form tissues, organs, and whole organisms. For instance, if you look at this building here, you see a facade made of brick. What holds the brick together is that mortar between the bricks. Imagine what would happen to this building if all of a sudden you made all the mortar disappear. I wouldn't want to be within 100 yards of that building because it would collapse on itself. If the extracellular matrix in your body disappeared, the same thing would happen to you. As a matter of fact, more than 50% of our body weight is actually this non-living extracellular matrix material. So one thing we do, we glue cells together to form tissues, and that's actually a very big step in the advent of uh, complex life on spike. Second thing is this. Extracellular matrix can be used Oh, you're, oh, you're doing notes now. Okay, as long as you're not texting your friends, that's not good. Okay, taking notes for five academics. Okay, all right. Okay, now second thing. The extracellular matrix is going to serve in the case of organismal structure as well. We'll see some examples of that. Not only are we gluing cells together, we're giving organisms important structural support. Think of where we would be if we had no bones. That's a form of extracellular matrix. We'll see that later. We had no tendons, no cartilage, no ligaments. What would we look like? We'd look like the blob. we just flow along in the floor. Extracellular matrix is critically important for organismal structure. And 
there is another very important but kind of hidden role. So far we've been looking at this stuff as a structural material, and indeed it is. But there's a third role that's very important too, and it was discovered much more late, you know, back in the 70s, it's still a while back. The extracellular matrix can signal cells much like a growth factor. Picture instead of these little tiny growth factor molecules, picture a solid state growth factor that can stimulate cell division and stimulate cell differentiation. And the extracellular matrix does indeed do that. In fact, it acts very much like a growth factor because as we're going to see, it activates through a different alternate pathway the RAS MHPK signaling pathway. No wonder it acts like a growth factor. It actually activates the same pathway that many growth factors do. And here again, absolutely essential. Signaling roles are very important in development and they're very important in tissue maintenance and repair. So we see that kind of thing, but that's sort of a somewhat hidden role. Okay. Well, let's take a look at some examples of extracellular matrix. Okay, for animals, think of stuff like what we call connective tissue. Cartilage, tendons, ligaments, fascia, those tissue sheets, like you get a piece of beef brisket, you get a silvery tough stuff, or a piece of liver, and you get silvery tough stuff. Okay, that's connective tissue. Okay, connective tissue in animals. Okay, that's one kind of thing. If you happen to take a look at a jellyfish, a nigarian, jellyfish have three layers of cells. A little thin outside layer, single cell thing, a little thin inner layer, and then this extracellular matrix, what we call the jelly, more technically the mesoglea. And that's the most of the mass of the jellyfish. And there are cells crawling around in that that produce that stuff. So jellyfish jelly is an example. All that stuff in Nigerians. Okay. Now most of these here, we have lots of proteins and polysaccharides, but some extracellular matrix materials are really very very, very rich in polysaccharides. Examples of this, plants and fungi. What do plants and fungi have in their cells that animal cells do not have? What? Did I hear somebody, what somebody said? Cell walls. Yes, we don't have cell walls. What are plant cell walls? They are made of cellulose fibers and other things thrown into boot. What cellulose? It's a secreted polysaccharide. So plant cell walls and fungal cell walls, which are made of the amino sugar-based polysaccharide called chitin, that's extracellular matrix. It happens to be very rich in polysaccharides, but it qualifies as extracellular matrix. So we can say plant and fungal cell walls. And not only do these cell walls protect the cells inside from os osmotic bursting, at least, because after all, if water rushes in, it's not going to burst if it's surrounded by a thick cell wall, and gives these cells mechanical protection, right? It's also very important structural element for the whole organism. Hey. Extracellular matrix. Wood. Cellulose. Things called phenolics and something real tough complex hydrophobic molecules called lipids. Makes the stuff tough. What that is over there, that piece of wood here. What is it? It's dead xylem tissue in the heart of a tree. The stuff is not functioning. Well, even when this was cut out of the log, this stuff hadn't been functioning for a long time. The heartwood of a plant, of a tree. But it's great structural support. Think of this stuff. It's strong, right? We use a lot in our construction. Most of our houses are made at least in part of this stuff. 
it's got a little bit of flexibility, not a huge amount, but a little bit. And it has a pretty good weight bearing capacity. Now think of this. You've got trees. You go to California, there's a redwood tree. 372 feet tall. That's about as tall as the tallest building in downtown Birmingham. Go out to Australia, the gum trees, Australian eucalyptus trees. Some of those guys top 300 feet, and there's some semi-reliable reports from loggers around the turn of the century that may have knocked a couple over that exceeded 400 feet in height. You have a living organism, hundreds of feet tall, that weighing tens of thousands of tons all supported by extracellular matrix, folks. So that's another example. These are very polysaccharide-rich ones. A third example. <coughs> the exoskeletons of arthropods. They're made mostly of chitin, of polysaccharide. Now, if you look at an arthropod, the outer layers, the outer epithelium of these organisms secrete and organize huge amounts of chitin to form that external skeleton, the, arc, the exoskeleton. And they serve as muscle attachment points for muscle protection, uh, making all kinds of things like limbs to move around efficiently, wings to fly with, stingers to sting you with nasty jaw parts, whatever the case is. So, exoskeletons are very important, both organismal structure and protection. Okay, that's a very important item. All right, so the exoskeleton of arthropods are exoskeletons. And we have some others, though. And these... Some types of extracellular matrix, proteins and or polysaccharides, have a remarkable ability of binding inorganic ions and forming crystals of minerals inside the matrix. So you have this material that's both proteins and polysaccharides and mineral crystals. So we can have certain kinds of mineralized extracellular matrix. A perfectly good example is what we have, bone. Inside bone, you have these cells called osteoblasts that produce and secrete a protein polysaccharide matrix. That matrix binds calcium ions and phosphate ions and <coughs> crystallizes it in certain forms of calcium phosphate crystals. Now, when you have the kind of thing where you have a mixture of inorganic and organic materials, you get essentially a composite material. Now think of all these high-tech composites that we use in our modern industry. Common kind of thing is you take graphite fibers, carbon fibers, and embed them in some kind of plastic resin matrix. And the combination of the two is lighter than aluminum, but stronger than steel. It has a tremendous strength. So you see these kinds of things, and things like really expensive fishing rods, and those thousand dollar racing bikes, Stuff like that. And they use them a lot in modern aircraft. Next time you take a flight, chances are quite a bit of the body of that plane is going to be made of these types of composite materials because they're light and they're strong. The downside, they can't take much heat. So they don't make the engine out of it and stuff. But we see that we use this kind of stuff in our technology all the time. The sum of the two components has more and better properties than either of the components by themselves. And bone is a perfectly good example. You have this organic stuff, proteins and polysaccharides, with mineral crystals in it. Now you can do a little mental experiment. Take a piece of bone. Take like a chicken bone. In fact, take three chicken bones. Take one chicken bone. Just keep it as is. Second one, throw it in vinegar, lemon juice, any kind of acid will do. Third one, you leave it out in the hot summer sun and let it bleach for a while. Now come back a few weeks later. That bone that has been outside and bleached, what's happened is all the organic stuff is broken down. Bacteria and fungi have gotten in and stuff like that. 
So it looks a little bit different. It still looks like a bone, but you pick it up and it's very soft and crumbly. And you can probably crumple it into dust with your bare hands. Reason why? All you got left is the mineral crystals. So although it looks like a bone, it has this very fragile and weak. Now, you take that bone that's been sitting in the vinegar for a month or two. It looks like a bone, you pull it out, and it's flexible. You can bend it, twist it like those fake bones they get through the dogs, like those doggy chew toys. It's got the same kind of consistency. Because in this case, the acid has dissolved the calcium phosphate. So all you have is your organic matrix left. So, it's flexible, you can bend a little bit, you can bend quite a bit, but it doesn't have much strength or load bearing capacity. You'd be in bad shape if that's what you had in place of your bones. Right, talk about rubber legs. Okay, well anyway. But the combination of the two has a little bit of flexibility and a lot of strength. So, in effect, these mineralized extracellular matrix materials give a combination of strength and often maybe a little bit of flexibility. Other examples of that. The shells of mollusks. Shellfish shells. What happens is the outer epithelial layer of these organisms, what we call the mantle, secretes a protein polysaccharide matrix that has the ability to take calcium carbonate or calcium and carbonate ions from the water, or calcium and phosphate ions, and make crystals. And it turns out a mollusk shell is actually stronger than even a single monocrystal of the material of whatever mineral it's made of. So you have, once again, these mollusk shells are very, very strong, and it's because it's a composite material. So that's another example. Many protists do this, too. There are plenty of shell protists, shell amoebas, diatoms, and stuff like that. Most of them have calcium carbonate or calcium phosphate shells. Here we have extracellular matrix that binds ions present in the water. Some of them, the diatoms, can even bind silicon ions and literally make shells of glass around themselves in any pattern that their genes choose to do so. Now that's an interesting thing. So we've got organisms that can crystallize minerals in whatever kind of pattern that they want. Right now, there are companies looking at this process, how these organisms do it, because they like to get some principles that we could apply to our own technology. Think of this, for instance. Both graphite and carbon and diamond are two forms of carbon crystallized in different ways. Graphite is dirt cheap, right? Diamond is not. Now, diamond didn't cost you know, thousands of dollars per carat. You can do a lot of useful things and make great lenses for microscopes. You can get rid of the oil immersion lens and use a diamond lens that can bend light quite nicely. You can do all kinds of cool things with diamond. Problem is, diamond's super expensive. Imagine if we could make some kind of artificial matrix that could crystallize carbon in a diamond form and make it not much more expensive than glass. We have lots of uses for diamond. Wedding rings would not be one of them anymore. <laughs> not that you can buy, you know, not that it sells for like $10 a gram or something like that, no. But at any rate, we can do a lot with that. So there are some small technology companies that are looking at this process of biomineralization, trying to gain general principles, and see if we can apply that, those principles to our own technology. Who knows, some stuff might be coming out in the market somewhere down the so we see all these kinds of cool functions of the extracellular matrix. And we're going to see what goes in it fairly soon. Now, a little kind of historical portion. It's safe to say that one of the big steps in generating multicellular life, especially animal life, was the ability to produce extracellular matrix. So now, you can glue cells together. You start out with a single cell and it starts dividing. You can glue them together and organize them to form a multicellular organism. Genetic and fossil evidence suggests that the first multicellular animals came around perhaps 700 million years ago. 
And in those days, they had soft body parts, but they were still the limited fossils. We have them show clearly that they're made, that they're large organisms, or moderately large, made of many different kinds of cells. Around 500 or so million years ago, in a period of Earth's life called the Cambrian period, all of a sudden we see this tremendous proliferation of hard shell organisms and a vast diversification, so much so they often call this period the Cambrian explosion because there was an explosion of animal diversity that happened a few tens of millions of years. And now you start finding in the appropriate rocks fossils all over the place because things that have hard body parts fossilize a lot easier than soft and squishy stuff. What may cause that? There's a whole bunch of different hypotheses, but one of them I wouldn't be surprised if it played a significant role, is this. The development of hard body parts, of extracellular matrix. We start seeing the first signs of mollusks, and there are other shelled organisms that aren't mollusks, but they look like clams and stuff. They're called brachiopods. There's still a few of them left nowadays. But you see these things with a hard external shell. You start seeing those. You start seeing the first arthropods. They're all marine in those days. But you start seeing the first arthropods with clearly signs, jointed legs, exoskeletons, compound eyes, the whole nine yards. So what may cause this explosion of diversity? Most of these things, some of these things, if you see them, most of them were very small, but we saw them nowadays and expanded to the size of a house or something. They great science fiction monsters. These look totally unearthly. They're long gone, but boy, there were a lot of very bizarre and weird body plans out there. All these kinds of arthropods and stuff with these hard shells. One possible thing that may happen is this. Organisms start developing things like chitin exoskeletons or mineralized extracellular matrix shells and stuff. When they do that, they're a lot harder to eat than something soft and squishy, right? So you got yourself an exoskeleton or shell around yourself and some wormy predator comes around and yeah, you think you're gonna get me going. Yeah, I do, yeah, you know. Okay, you're safe. But of course, the predators aren't gonna be resting on their lures. Like, okay, yeah, laugh while you can, but I can play around with chitin too and I'm gonna make a whole bunch of nasty, stabby things, pokey things crushing things and stuff, and I'm going to get your butt anyway, so just sit there, I'm coming back, I'll be back and then get you. So you can have a predator-prey arms race, defense and offense. Remember the Cold War? How much the U.S. and Russia spent developing all kinds of new fancy weapon systems when they already had far more than they needed? Same kind of thing. So it's possible that a predator-prey arms race due to Exoskeletons, external shells, and stuff like that contribute to this vast explosion of animal diversity. So it's safe to say that extracellular matrix, the ability to produce and secrete this stuff, was a major breakthrough in the evolution of life on this planet. Okay.